Hey guys, for all you guys coming out west this fall, you might be worried about how your body will deal with the altitude. Over the years, I had four altitude related guidelines I would tell all of my clients and all the hunters that we packed in. I've said them so many times, I literally have the spiel memorized. Now when guys would follow these suggestions, less than two to three percent of them would end up with altitude related issues. If they didn't follow these suggestions, it was probably more like 10 to 15 percent would have an issue. I'll go over these guidelines in this video Video so you guys can apply them to your hunts and have less worries about altitude. At the end of the video, I'll also give you unlucky guys, the guys in the two to three percent that just have issues regardless of the precautions you take. I'll give you guys some quick recommendations. If you have no clue who I am, my name's Cliff Gray. I built, owned, operated, and sold some of the largest wilderness businesses in North America. I've guided and outfitted over a thousand big game hunts, and my insights and strategies in these videos are based on that data set. I hope you guys get some value from them. Subscribe to the channel and get on my newsletter at PursuitWithCliff.com. My hunting camps were high, even for elk camps. Most of them were between 10,000 and 12,000 feet. So I always had a litany of questions regarding altitude, particularly from guys that had historical health issues, were older, or knew they were gonna come into the hunt out of shape. The first thing I'll say is that most of the worry related to getting severe altitude sickness on elk hunts is statistically unwarranted. Even out of shape guys and folks with health, health issues rarely have a problem beyond, you know, beyond the simple mild symptoms. Now having said that, I'm not a doctor and unfortunately the distribution of problems is a bit of a barbell. The vast vast majority of guys don't have any issues at elk hunting altitudes but I have seen some insane negative transformation in guys that got struck by altitude hard. When this happens at a minimum it will ruin your hunt and at the worst it can be life-threatening if the symptoms progress. So here's the pre-pack in briefing. Number one, don't get exhausted for the first 36 to 48 hours. I'd usually stare directly into the eyes of the younger hunters when I said this. This is for you guys, all right? The number one way that guys get themselves in trouble with altitude is pushing it during the first 24 to 36 hours of getting into the mountain. Let's say that gasping for air, hunched over, close to barfing is 100% physical exhaustion. In the first 36 to 48 hours, keep yourself below 70% of this. You should be able to recover at all times with a couple minute break and then comfortably comfortably keep moving. This is the one that causes the most problems for younger guys, guys that are in shape, they're healthy, etc. These are people who are used to pushing their physical limits and they think they know their body's ability to recover. Well at altitude, when you get beat up early on while you're still acclimating, sometimes you don't recover. Your body is dealing with reduced oxygen, acclimation, dietary changes, and a lot of the time reduced sleep due to the altitude and camping environment. And I get it guys, you're excited you've been thinking about this trip for months. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go on a hiking bender the first afternoon. This is a mistake. Do your very best to resist that urge. My action advice here, if you are getting packed in via horses, you know, remote stuff, seven to 15 miles into a wilderness area, use that first, you know, the arrival afternoon to relax and get your camp logistics set up. You can do a little scouting, maybe sub mile hike from camp, that sort of thing, but keep it really minimal. Guys that don't ride much have no idea how hard riding horses is on the average guy, okay? That in itself is gonna be exhausting. Now, if you're backpacking into an area, it's even trickier. Backpacking is inherently exhausting in itself, right? So when planning your hunt, have several camping locations mapped out. Make sure the first one is absurdly closer than you think it should be. The number one way to get, get yourself screwed up in a backpack hunt is, be, is to be hiking into the late hours of the dark, scrambling to set up camp, and then get exhausted in the process. By the way, it's not uncommon for backpack hunters to be walking right past elk. So, you know, mark out a, a, you know, a close camping spot for your first camping spot. You may or may not use it, but if you do, just consider that you're not necessarily just, you know, wasting a day of hunting. There might be elk right there, all right? But it gives you the opportunity to not get yourself in that predicament of getting late and getting exhausted. Number two, stay hydrated. Okay, so two things for you guys to understand on hydration. First, showing up at a trailhead, seeing your buddies, the anticipation of the hunt, all of your normal routines around taking care of yourself 
all of a sudden go out of the window, okay? Including staying hydrated. As an anecdote, I'll give you guys this. A couple months ago, my wife and I surprised our kids with a Disneyland trip, and we went hard at Disneyland, all right? We rode all the rides, it was awesome, but it was like 13 hours a day. The problem was I literally forgot to take a shit for three days. I still feel like my, dig my digestive tract is recovering right now. Same thing happens in the mountains, all right, on these hunts. Guys forget to drink water, they forget to eat, but just a lot of times water is the thing that goes by the wayside. The second issue is that we combine this lack of attentiveness on hydration with the fact that non-acclimated people dehydrate at a rapid rate. Even if, you, even if you don't notice it, your breathing rate and heart rate go way up at elevation. This equates to rapid water loss water loss through the, the respiration. Then when you become dehydrated, your body quits the process of acclimating to the altitude. And then, you know, those two factors combine, you know, the dehydration and the fact you, you're not acclimating anymore, you end up with big issues. My action advice here is before you show up to the trailhead, have a bottle or blad you know, water bladder full of a set amount of water and make it a goal for that day of pack-in that you completely drink that by day's end. This way, if you get behind, the bottle by itself is a reminder that you have catching up to do in terms of your dehydration. So do that, guys, and stay hydrated. Number three, don't drink booze for at least the first couple days. This is self-explanatory, but it's a thing for some groups. On the science front, drinking booze means more dehydrations, poor sleep, and that equals stopping that acclimation process. So here's my thought on it. For guys that are serious about mountain hunting, this isn't even on their radar, to be honest, but sometimes they talk guys into going with them that are a lot less serious about the hunting aspect. Just realize that group hunting in the mountains is a weakest link endeavor. One guy can screw up the whole deal. Beware of a tag along hunting buddy that wants to drink while acclimating. You could screw up a whole hunt. I've seen it a bunch of times. The fourth one guys, don't let minor symptoms that you've never felt immediately take you off the mountain. The first big one is panic attacks. This brings back some epic memories of my outfitting days. I'd get these sat phone calls from guys that were basically a bit hypoxic, sounding like they were, you know, essentially shit faced and it would go like this. Cliff, I think something is wrong. I've never felt this way. I, I can't tell you what it is on my chest. I don't know if I'm having a heart attack or what. I can't sleep. I have an insane amount of anxiety. And I'll come back and say, okay, man, you know, we're six or seven hours out, even if we run to get horses right now. Can you make it through the night and see how it feels in the morning? And usually the response would come back and it'd be like a whimper. And on the other end, I'd get the response to say, Cliff, I just, I just think I can't make it, man. I'm not going to make it through the night. All right. And then I'd have their wives call me. And a lot of times it'd just be like all out panic. All right. Now, I was in the service business. So yes, myself and my crew had several instances where we would go in and pack out guys at midnight due to this situation. I never pushed back. All right. But in every case, the guy was 90% better when we when we dropped 2,000 feet and got back to the ranch. A lot of times they'd be a little embarrassed or whatever. Now, I'm not a doctor, and this exact situation could arise from a guy that was actually having a heart attack, you know, actually had altitude sickness that was reaching dangerous levels or something like that. So I'm not here to make light of that. However, when guys know that this anxiety and panic deal is a symptom of altitude sickness, that knowing in itself allows them to manage the situation better and get to the next morning a lot of the time. And a lot of the time, those guys will reassess in the morning and the majority of them will feel acclimated enough to go on with the hunt. Sure, some come down, but not the majority. The second common symptom to be prepared for is lack of sleep. I still have this myself if I'm in a backpack tent up above, uh, up above 11,000 feet, even though I live at you know 7,000 feet, which is relatively high. Just realize it's inevitable. Don't let this man manifest itself in the, you know, this self-inflicted insomnia on the mountain. You're going to have a little trouble sleeping. Don't worry about it. If you realize it's going to happen, you'll get over it. The other thing is a negative attitude. Some guys will notice a bad attitude in themselves or hunting partners, all right? 
guys that are typically very positive folks. When this happens, don't let it man manifest itself into a quitting mentality. A lot of the time it's a minor symptom of alt altitude, lack of sleep, etc. And it can be fleeting if you deal with it in that way. View it as a fleeting kind of mood shift, all right? If you want more information on this, check out my video that's, you know, why hunters quit. I go into this stuff in detail. All right, guys, that was the briefing with some additional information thrown in. It really did help over the years. I think it helped a lot of clients enjoy themselves a lot better in the mountains. Like I said, most of you won't have an issue. Obviously, it's a serious thing, so take it seriously if you or a hunting partner gets progressing symptoms while you're on your hunt. Sometimes the only way to deal with it is to descend and rest. Okay, I'll end with some thoughts for the unlucky guys that are just prone to having problems. You can speak to a doctor about the situation. They are most likely going to prescribe you a medication called Diamox. I have had many clients that this, this stuff worked wonders for, but a lot of them also had to deal with some of the side effects. A lot of them, you know, really it's drowsiness is the main one. Another route to consider is that there's a huge difference between camps at 7,000 feet and 11,000 feet, particularly if you throw Idaho and Montana into the mix. There are a lot of low elevation options to hunt elk in. Consider those as it makes a huge difference. There's a lot of difference between 7,000 feet, you know, living, sleeping, and hunting at 7,000 versus 11,000. Another one is just adding a couple days to your trip for acclimation. The guys that drive through the night before, then backpack or ride in right after the drive are more prone to issues. You're combining fatigue, you know the the dehydration from driving and that diet and then the quick and then you're quickly ascending the altitude that's a bad mix if you can stay in that five to eight thousand range in a hotel beforehand you you for a couple days you're going to acclimate a lot better i'd say 50 50 to 60 percent of my guided clients took this approach and it worked the last thing to consider is a cabin-based or road-based hunt if you're prone to altitude sickness. Some guys scoff at this, but I know lots of guys that are highly successful with this type of hunt, and many of them are in good shape. They just take advantage of that by doing longer hikes on day hunts. One of the major issues when it comes to altitude for backpack and even horse pack, pack and hunts is that the exertion is front loaded and overlaps with the body's acclimation period. On these road based camps, you can progressively work into more physical days, okay? So you're gonna have potentially a lot less problem. All right, guys, I hope that helps you guys have fun out there and be more successful. In the end, try not to worry about this when you're prepping for a hunt, but just, you know, use these precautions and think about it. Check out my other videos, guys, and subscribe. Like always, I really appreciate you watching the video. Thanks.